Armin G. Scoville, S-C-O-V-I-L-L-E. Uh, Glenn Salter, S as in Sam, A-L-T-E-R. Okay. Um, this is part of the appellate court's legacy project. Uh, today we are talking with uh, retired justice, presiding justice actually, Harmon G. Scoville from the uh, 4th Appellate District, uh, Division Three in Santa Ana. And we'll be talking with him about his history on the California Court of Appeal. Uh, also uh, in the room with us today is his son, uh, Scott Scoville. Um, Justice Scoville, before we start, I just want to remind you of a comment that you probably heard on many, many occasions. You were always referred to in the legal community as a judge's judge. I thought that was the greatest compliment. Yeah, I appreciate that. So I'm sure that by the time we finish the interview today, everyone will know why that you've obtained that uh, uh, comment. Um, I understand that uh, in your chambers, you, you used to always have a picture of your great-great-grandfather on the wall. What I is, did. Mm -hmm. what, is the, uh, what was the significance of that picture to you? Well, he, uh, in his earlier days, uh, had uh, known Abraham Lincoln. I believe he lived in, what, Springfield, Illinois? Yeah. Right. And uh, how, how did he know Abraham Lincoln? Was he, was he his, his attorney? Was that the connection? Well, he had tried a case for them. Oh, really? Yes. And uh, I believe that your middle initial is G, and so there's... Yeah, it's Grosbeck. And that was his name as well. Yeah. So, uh, so when he... Uh, my understanding is when he went to, to uh, uh, leave Springfield, uh, Abraham Lincoln was opposed to that. Well, I don't know that that was necessarily so... I do know that uh, he left. And where did he go? To Utah. Utah. And I believe you were born in Utah, Ogden, Utah. Yes, that's right. That December 21, 1922. Right. What was the area like there when you grew up in the 1920s? It was nice. Nice area. Had snow in the wintertime, summertime. We're good. Was this sort of a rural area? No, no. We had a large uh, brick house. My dad did, 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 made sure that uh, it was well done. And uh, what, what business was he in at that time? My dad was a, uh, in, in the broom business. Uh, manufacturing brooms? Yes. So did he owned a lot of factories through the United States. Oh, he did. Do you remember the name of those factories? Well, it was a Skull Room Company. Oh, really? Um, I understand, though, that after a few years there, he moved on to Los Angeles. That's right. And uh, we came with him. Do you remember why he uh, decided to move to Los Angeles? Well, times were rough. It was very hard. And uh, he had a brother who had an, an interest, in, as well as my dad, in a broom factory in Los Angeles. And so that was where they went. Do you remember where in Los Angeles that broom factory was? Yeah, it was on East 4th Street in Los Angeles. Oh. Uh, Let's see, I understand that you actually worked in the broom factory. For I did, a while. starting at 11 years of age. And what were you hired to do? I used to have to uh, sort out the uh, corn in the morning, broom corn, and uh, load the trucks. And uh, it was a miserable job. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. Yeah. 
Is that when you first started having thoughts that you wanted to maybe do something yes, else? Yes, I wanted to have something that I could wear a shirt to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, I understand you had a had some friend a friend who uh, whose father worked in the in the legal business at that time uh, was a court clerk, I believe. Yes. <clears throat> He was a court clerk in uh, Ogden, Utah. Oh, I thought he was a court clerk here in Los Angeles. No. So did you did you get to go to any court proceedings when you were younger here in Los Angeles? Oh yes, I did. Do you remember uh, any, or do you uh, any of those uh, proceedings? Was it was this the the Superior Court in downtown Los Angeles? No, I don't remember. Okay. Um, I was always sort of curious, did your mother work in the family business as well? No. She's, she's, was she just a homemaker? Yes. Did you have any brothers and sisters? I did. I had an older sister, Ruth, a younger sister, Janet. Um... I understand that uh, you were very active in the in the Boy Scouts. That's right. When did you start in the Boy Scouts? Well, as soon as I was old enough. I like scouting. I like the trips. I enjoy the camaraderie of the of scouting. And uh, I stayed in scouting until I. Attained my eagle rank and then stayed on longer. What type of trips did you take? You said you enjoyed trips. For... All these were trips in, uh, that we did in scouting. Were these these uh, field trips? Field trips, yes. How many badges did you earn? Or did they have badges then? Oh, yes, time? they had merit badges. And I had enough to get my eagle award. How many badges did that take at that time? Twenty-one, I think. Twenty-one? And I had more than that. I understand you graduated from uh, Los Angeles High School in, in 1940. That's right. Uh, did you have any favorite teachers or classes? Oh, yes. Yes. Who was your, who was your favorite uh, teacher? I guess Miss McNaughton was probably. And what, what class? She taught Latin and uh, English. And, Languages. Yeah. Was she sort of your mentor at the school? I don't know that she was, but uh, I uh, I sure enjoyed her. I uh, did you participate in school in any uh, extra? Oh yes, I was debater. I was on the debate team for how many years? A number of years. Uh, with. Uh, were the, these were local debates against other high schools? Against other high schools, right. Uh, did you do any athletics when you were in school? Uh, no, uh, except in the uh, classes that they prescribed for us. Mm -hmm. I remember playing basketball and uh, they prescribed those classes for us. Any girlfriends? Or do you want to talk about that? <laughs> oh yeah, I had, uh, I liked some girls, but I was too busy. I uh, had a paper out and uh, got up early in the morning, and so I didn't do much day. Oh, okay. So the paper route was at the L.A. Times. The L.A. Times. I think you actually worked for the Times later on too. Didn't I sure you? did. And you knew the Chandlers. No, I didn't. Um, when you were in high school, it was 1940, how aware were you and how aware were your classmates of the impending Second World War? I was uh, in the uh, office of the, the Times building when we first got word that uh, Pearl Harbor had been bombed. 
And I remember the news came in, and uh, I was there in the time building. At the time the news came that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. How did you respond to, to that? Oh, I think that uh, we were all very surprised. Were you thinking about enlisting at that point? Because you did at one point join the military. Oh, I did. Well, it was later, a little late later than that. Did you go to UCLA right then? Yes. In 19, uh, I graduated from high school in 1960 and immediately started at UCLA. And uh, what was your major? I had three majors. Uh, I uh, had uh, military science and uh, political science and public speaking. I had, uh, they called it a general major. How long were you in UCLA before you enlisted? <clears throat> Just about a year and a half because, uh, yeah, just about a year and a half. What branch of service did you join? Well, I was in ROTC, and so I stayed in the infantry. And where did you do your training? Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, did you enjoy training? Was <laughs> oh, the training was good at Fort Benning. We had good instructors, and the weather was hot. However, I do remember that uh, October was one of the nicest parts of the year. So how long were you in Fort Benning? Until I graduated and got my commission. So you were an officer's candidate school then? Yeah. And commissioned as a lieutenant? Right. And uh, where, was your, where was your first assignment? At uh, Camp Meade, Maryland. And uh, what were your duties at that point? Well, I was uh, an officer and was assigned to a company. And uh, I remember uh, going into the office of the commanding uh, officer at the time is a colonel um, and the um, the colonel was very nice to me and uh, we uh, we took some trips together i you did eventually get sent over or shipped over to germany at one point yeah i went to germany what year was that? B-43. And uh, were, you, were you in the front lines or were you uh, with... No, the... I uh, never, I didn't see any combat. Who, um, uh, when, the, when the war was over, uh, I believe you were sent down to Nuremberg, is that correct? Well, no. I, uh, when the war ended, I was in Germany and uh, stayed in Germany for a while and uh, attended the University of Heidelberg because I enjoyed uh, the uh, scholastics and I enjoyed the University of Heidelberg. I had um, courses in uh, German and in civics, and uh, I just enjoyed it very much. And I lived in, um, at that time we were stationed uh, near Munich. Did you ever get a chance to see, uh, did you get a chance to get to Nuremberg for the Nuremberg trials? No, I did not. When the war was over, and after your time in Heidelberg, uh, you you came back to the United States, and yeah, and you went back to UCLA. 
Yes. Um, was there was there any professor or class at the university that uh, sort of pointed you in the direction of going towards the law? Well, I don't know that it was towards the law, but I had a professor of, uh, in public speaking who I liked a lot. A lot. And uh, I always remember the fact that uh, this one professor, I uh, expected an A in the course, and he gave me a B, and, and <laughs> so I wrote a letter to him. And so, uh, <laughs> I always remember that. I regret that very much because I deserve to be, and uh, I wanted an A. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming he didn't change the grade. No. Did he write back? No. <laughs> why, um, why did you decide to go to law school? Well, from the time I was 14, I wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't want to be a doctor, and I didn't want to be in school all the time. And so I really enjoyed being a lawyer. Now, you went to Stanford Law School, uh, yeah. graduated in 1950. Um, why, why did you choose Stanford Law School? It's a great law school. Yeah. Well, why Stanford? I think it was one of the best in the country. At that time, Stanford was the best in the country. <laughs> we had outranked uh, and had beat out Harvard. And so it was Harvard and Stanford. And uh, I chose uh, Stanford. So you were accepted at Harvard too? Yes. Um, did you enjoy your, your law school? Oh, very or? much. Mm -hmm. What was it about law school that excited you? It was the companionship of a lot of the other attendees. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the fact that I wanted to be a lawyer that kind of spurred me on and stayed in law school. They always tell stories of about that time, the late 40s, early 1950s, that when you would go to law school, the first lecture would be, you know, look to the left and look to the right. Those people won't be here three years later. Yep, that's right. Did they give you that lecture? Yeah, I had the look to the left, look to the right, and uh, only one of you is going to stay. <laughs> How many were in that entering class? I think there were about 150. And how many did eventually graduate, do you remember? Oh, just about a third of us. So they were accurate. Yep. Uh, were the two next to you, were they were the ones who were gone? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> uh, now, I understand that you actually, this is when you also worked at the LA Times. Well, I uh, when I came out of the Army, I... Uh, asked for a job in the uh, LA Times because I needed the money for schooling. I needed the money for uh, tuition, mm -hmm. books. And so I asked for the job and they gave it to me. And what were you doing at the LA Times? <clears throat> I was what they called a road, road bend. In other words, I um, I went around and uh, checked on a lot of the um, things that were done in, uh, in delivery of the times. Mm. And was this, um, was this during the summertime then, before school? Well, I worked full time. And I worked uh, during school, too, and uh, went to UCLA and worked at the Times. Now, once you went to Stanford, did you continue working at the Times? No, I did not. Um, 
When you graduated from law school, you came back to Los Angeles to That's right. work for a, a law firm. Yeah, um, Tripp and Newcomb, Ryocomb and Thomas. And what was life like for a young attorney fresh out of the best law school in the country? <laughs> well, I thought it was pretty good. Uh, we had a good boss. I remember the law firm, Tripp and Newcomb, Yoakum and Thomas. And uh, it was good. What type of, uh, what area of law did you practice? It was all civil. I didn't, didn't go into the criminal field. Did you it was get, not criminal law. Did you get an opportunity to go to court in those first years? Yes, sure did. Do you remember that first time you walked into court? Most lawyers do. Mm. Trying to think what case it was. As we had a number of cases that uh, we went to court on. I just don't uh, recall the name of the case. At the time, uh, lawyers weren't paid as well as they are today. Oh, no. What, what, what salary did you get, or did you have to start out? We started at 275 a month. That was it. $275 a month. I had a, I and then, heard... then went up to 300 and then 350 400 Did you have to buy a hat? <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I was told by a lot of attorneys that back in that time, the first thing they made you do was buy a hat. All yeah. lawyers wore hats, so. Oh, this was in the San Francisco area where they did that. Mm. I was uh, not, uh, not in that area where we had to buy hats. You, you at some point moved down to, to Orange County. Was there... You know, why did you Why did you come to Orange County? I was offered a job with a law firm in Orange County, and I accepted. I came down, and started working in Orange County. Did you enjoy that move? Do you think it was a good move? It was a good move. Yeah. Smaller county. Yeah. Chance to go to court. Yeah. What did you think of the Orange County judges? I thought they were good, very good, did, did very good that, judges. Did you at that point see maybe yourself being a judge? Yes. Um, were there any cases that, that you remember that were, or any court situations that uh, come back to mind about uh, the way judges handled their court or maybe didn't handle it as well as they should have? Yeah. Yeah. There were. Seems to me one time some judge didn't want to read, read your brief after you'd spent time and effort on it. <clears throat> yeah, that's true. Can you name that judge, or should we keep that anonymous at this point? <laughs> oh, no, we keep it anonymous. <laughs> Did he tell you, actually, he just wouldn't read your brief? I don't remember the specific words. Uh, there, I think there was another time, too, wasn't there, where um, some judge kept a lot of uh, attorneys waiting in court while he heard just one motion? Yes. I remember that judge. What was he your... heard about 16 cases and uh, just kept us all waiting. And then uh, finally went back and followed his calendar. How did that, uh, what did you I, think about I that? I didn't like that. I thought that a judge shouldn't do that. I thought a judge should handle these cases and take them in order. And, and uh, dispose of them. Uh, 
I assume by now you must have been married. Were you married at this point? I uh, was married, yes. And children? Had three, and uh, well, actually, I had five. Five children. Hmm. Now, the, you were appointed to the municipal court bench in 1967, I believe. Um, at the time, uh, the appointment process was a little different than it is today. Yeah, I didn't make an application. I, uh, Can you tell us what happened? Well, I had uh, been working in, in politics and was very active in the Republican Party in politics. And when uh, Reagan came, they uh, just uh, they named me to the bench. And um, then after that, I applied for Superior Court, and I did make an application for that. Well, I believe on the one to the municipal court, didn't you just get a phone call from somebody asking if there was maybe some interest on your part? Yeah, just a phone call from the appointment secretary. And that was all. What type, of, <coughs> what type of cases did you work on on the municipal court? In municipal court, uh, it was mainly uh, a lot of traffic. Because in that, those days, we, the municipal court handled traffic cases. So we had traffic cases. Now, I assume you enjoyed going to the Superior Court. Oh, very much, yeah. Um, I understand that when you were in the Superior Court, you believed very much in the settlement process. That case you That's just, the case. That's true. Um, it's, it's also been said that you settled more than half the cases that were sent to you. I think so. What do you think makes a good settlement judge? A judge that will listen to both sides, be fair, and, and make an equitable decision. Um, what type of attorneys do you think do best in that, in that setting? Ones that are uh, willing to negotiate and, uh, and uh, compromise and uh, Want, want a settlement. If an attorney does not want a settlement, you're not going to get it. Are there any tricks that uh, the judge has to know when an attorney may be saying one thing, but such as, I won't settle, but uh, they, uh, they are willing to settle? How do you know that a case will settle? Well, you, you sense it uh, after being on the bench for a while. You sense it from different attorneys, and, and then you know them by their experience and by name. But um, we had a lot of uh, cases that we settled. Orange County was a pretty small legal community at the time. Yeah. Um, did you attend a lot of bar functions? Yes, yeah, sure did. Did you ever become president of the uh, Orange County Bar Association? No. <clears throat> You've also been quoted at one point saying that you have a... Uh, you were for a short time, weren't you? And then you got appointed? Weren't you president of Orange County Bar? For like a short period and then you got elevated to judge? Oh, I guess that was true. There was a period of time that I was appointed and then uh, was elevated. You've also been quoted as saying that uh, you have great faith in the jury system. I do. But sometimes juries get it wrong. That's right. <laughs> there was a case, I believe, a paternity case that you set aside a verdict. Do you remember that case? Not particularly. There was a, a woman who testified that the man was the father, and uh, the jury found that true. And remember, remember setting aside that that verdict? No, but I know that I did. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you were vindicated in that case too. Yes. Uh -huh. So 
So the, the DA apparently investigated further after you set that aside. I set it aside and he did it and he investigated further and found that I was right. And that she had lied. No. Uh -huh. um, you also brought a rather innovative approach to jury selection to Orange County. Uh, bringing in panels of 18 instead of panels of 12. Yeah. Do you remember who, where you picked up that, uh, that idea? No. No, but it made sense to me to have panels that uh, could function better. How did the attorneys respond the first time you uh, made that suggestion? Well, I think they liked it. Do you think in the long run it worked out well? I think so. Did any did any other judges in the uh, Superior Court take up your idea? No, not that I think of. <clears throat> you had a case uh, one time with an 11-year-old boy who had AIDS. AIDS. I, I did. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a, a little bit about that case? Well, it was a, a landmark case, and it was the first case that we had had in Orange County involving AIDS. And uh, somebody didn't want him in school, I think. Is yeah, the school district didn't want him, but I ordered that he be there, and so that was against the. Uh, Times. Um, I think if there was one thing everybody knew about you in terms of coming to court was punctuality. Yeah, I tried to always be prompt. But the story was that you would wait until the second hand would hit 12 and then you'd be on the bench. Yeah, right that's on about the right. There's also a story one time when you were on the Court of Appeal that uh, only two of you came out for the panel and that the third justice came running out about five minutes later and that you never said a word to, it, to the to counsel. You just let the, the scene unfold and everybody knew what was going on. Yeah, I don't remember that. No. Um, you were the presiding judge of the Superior Court there for a couple of years. Yes, I was. Did you enjoy that position? Oh, very much. What was it about doing that that you liked as opposed to being in the trial court trying cases? Well, you had the opportunity to assign cases. And uh, that, I thought, was a good uh, thing. Do you remember how many judges there were in the Superior Court at that time? About 26. And you had the Department 1 calendar, too. Yeah. What, what transpired in Department 1? We don't have a Department 1 anymore with our direct calendaring systems. What, how, was, how were cases assigned at that point? Well, they... Uh, By the type of case that uh, was filed, they could tell what it was, whether it was a domestic, a criminal, or civil. And I think that uh, we picked up from there. I don't remember uh, anything further. Mm. Okay. But you enjoyed being the presiding judge. And I sure did. Uh, you were... Um, nominated in 1988 to replace Justice Trotter as the presiding justice of the uh, Court of Appeal in Santa Ana. That's true. Um, is that something that you wanted? Yes, I think so. What was it about being an appellate justice that appealed to you? Well, the fact that you could uh, make decisions and uh, have the camaraderie and, and uh, the association with the other justices. Do 
Do you feel that it was a collegial environment at the uh, Court of Appeal? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> what did you enjoy most about being the presiding justice? Well, I think we had the flexibility of picking and choosing cases. Did you enjoy the give and take that occurred between justices on particular cases? Yes. I think that uh, the justices spoke their minds and would tell the uh, audience and the spectators there in the audience what their opinions were. Did you enjoy the writing process of being an appellate justice? Yes. As long as I had good clerks like you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Although Megan, I think, was, the, was very good. Um, well, you were good, too. Oh, well, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, you know, you were always known for bringing donuts around the, around the court. Yeah, that's true. Did you pick that up from your days as a settlement conference judge? Probably. <laughs> that was always one of the great, great uh, parts of the day, coming around and eating yeah. donuts. Um, you remember you had a secretary by the name of Marion. Sure do. English woman. Yes. Very formal. Yes. She, um, how did you get along with, with her? How did she... How do you think the two of you fit together? I thought we did very well. <coughs> I liked her, and uh, I think she liked me. Uh, I, th I thought we got along well. well those, were, those were good days. Um, you know, there were some interesting arguments at the court. Um, what part of the oral argument process did you enjoy? The summations. Uh, were, there, were there any particular attorneys or arguments that you really thought exemplified what it meant to be an appellate attorney? Not that I can think of right now. Um, You know, you wrote a number of published opinions in all different areas of the, of the law. Yes. Um, one of the ones that, although I'm not sure you'd call it the most significant case, the one that was of interest to me was, I don't know if you remember it, it involved a uh, traffic court clerk who was taking money but not depositing it <coughs> with, the, uh, with the county. Do you remember that case? No. He was charged with bribery as well as yeah. embezzlement. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> you were, um, um, he was actually, you know, he was convicted of both of those, and you set aside the one, basically saying you can do one, but you can't do both. Yeah. Um, did you have any pro? I mean, did, how did it? What, were your, what was your reaction in terms of setting aside criminal convictions? Did that... Uh... I did it very carefully because uh, I felt that the jury, if, if they had decided one way, that that should probably stand. And I was very much in favor of a jury of verdicts. But uh, when I had a case before me that was out of line, and I didn't hesitate to set it aside. Uh, you were on the court for a little over two years, and then yes. you decided to take another another job um, with the Buck Trust as a as a special master. Yes. Um, who talked you into moving on to uh, to the Buck Trust? Oh, I. Um... I think it was probably Homer Thompson. And what was the big selling point? Why, why was he interested in moving you, as opposed to somebody else, up to the as the special master? I don't know. 
He used to indicate that he was very respectful of your settlement abilities and your abilities to deal with people. Yeah. Um, were you and Homer classmates? Yes, we were classmates at Stanford. He was a retired judge, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, you were you were a judge for a lot of years. What what advice would you, based on your years of experience, give to a new judge, newly appointed judge? Listen carefully to all the facts of a case, and then uh, weigh both sides, and give both sides you, your best shot. Yeah, you gotta you gotta be fair on both sides. How about patience? You gotta have patience. Is that sometimes difficult to do? No. When uh, 1987 you were named Orange County Judge of the Year by the Women Lawyers Association. Um, 1989 you received the Sam Barnes Award. And then in 1990 when you retired from the Court of Appeal they actually created an award called the Harmon G. Scoble Award for Excellence in Community Service, giving to the bench and bar. Um, how did it feel to have a an award named after named after you? I was very flattered and uh, very appreciative of the recognition. Um, I guess I have just really one final question I'd like to ask, and you know my literary bent, so it won't come as a complete surprise, but Maxwell Anderson wrote a play called Star Wagon, and in that play all the characters were given an opportunity to go back and do their life over again, a second chance. If you could go back, what one thing would you do differently? I don't think it very much. I don't think there's very much that I'd change. Is there anything you wish had turned out differently? Oh yes, I. I think that there are different areas that uh, I could have done better. If you had a, had an opportunity. Would you go back and change those things? Yeah, probably. Justice Scovo, uh, I appreciate all the time that you've given to uh, to the court system, to the legal system, and for even for this interview as well. And uh, I think it's very clear that in the, you have been and still are a judge's judge. Yeah. And I really appreciate uh, having. Thank you, Glenn. To know you for all these years, absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to know you.